death creates the value of life. Without death, nothing else has meaning. At any point, you could be too late and then you've missed out on the opportunity. One day he broke down crying. It took that healing to give him the vulnerability to process the emotions that he just never dealt with. You're likely to be forgotten and people don't want to be forgotten. It's a final resting place that doesn't feel or look like a cemetery. It's growing, it's evolving, it's changing. And for families, it's not a full stop. It doesn't remind them of the end. It reminds them of the life that they shared. Don't be caught dead. The show bringing stories of death back to life. Here's your host, Catherine Ashton. Today, I'm speaking with Luke Roberts of Mornington Green. He was a lawyer in his life and he did a master's, he studied overseas, or I should say he lived overseas and now he's back on the peninsula and I'm really intrigued to hear his story because I actually visited Morning Green about a week and a half ago and I'm absolutely fascinated with the work that they're doing. So I won't introduce Luke anymore, I'll let him tell his own story. Thank you so much for being with us, Luke. Uh, thank you, Catherine. It's great to you know have this opportunity to chat with you. You know, I've seen what you're doing. I think it's really fantastic. Like you said, I lived in a whole other world before this, but since getting into this world, it really is a tremendous privilege to be able to play a role in such a pivotal human experience. And, you know, death, in my view, creates the value of life. You know, it's such an important thing. Without death, nothing else has meaning. You know, it really does give meaning to life. But the event of a death of somebody that you love has the potential to make people implode or to facilitate expansion, if you will. You know, it really does. It can make people realize that they need to take step up and take advantage of this life left behind and to honor the memory and the impact that that person's had on their lives by living properly, you know, and with vitality. But one of those things that we see time and time again on the implosion side is when people don't make arrangements. It's horrendous, you know, and I think what you're doing about getting people to stop procrastinating, actively put these things down, put their wishes down on paper, get it known, be known, because it's so easy to oh, just keep, keep kicking the stone down the track, keep kicking it down. But at any point, you're too late. At any point, you could be too late and then you've missed out on the opportunity. And it really is an act of love. It's an act of love to save those people you've left behind from having to deal with admin and the financial and the emotional burden having to consider everybody else's opinion and then you know one of the classic things that like my dad's generation is like, just throw me in the bin who cares you know but it it's so important that for us that we honor those people's lives and we want to do it in the perfect way because they had such a big impact on us you know and unfortunately it's just a i think human nature to i guess evade this topic of death and not wanting to talk about it but it is going to happen for every one of us and you can do it well. You know, you can do it in a way that doesn't screw everybody up. So anyway, my story, yeah, I was a lawyer. I enjoyed it. It was a, you know, a good career path. It was what I always sort of wanted to do or well, what I thought I wanted to do. And, you know, I did degree after degree, but then, you know, you get to that point where you sort of ticked off most of the things. I'm not very happy. <laughs> this, is, this isn't giving me the fulfillment I want. And I had my first son and I was very aware of the environmental damage that we as humans were doing and wanting to make a change. But you got to walk the walk, right? You want to tell your kids, hey, you can make the change that you want in the world and then sit back and pretend as if it's not happening. No, you got to do something about it. So I was looking around like sort of sustainable energy jobs, things like that. And this time my brother, who's always been very creative and always had very out-of-the-box ideas, he'd been talking about this idea of, you know, people really need to be in nature when they're dealing with grief. Nature is the ultimate unifier of all of us and it does heal grief. And, and it does, you know, we know this intuitively, but now science has shown it that, Spending time in nature helps deal with depression, anxiety, and obviously also with grief. You know, so like, this is the way to do it. And unfortunately, you know, for him, it actually, the aha moment came through tragedy. You know, one of his best friends was a beautiful woman, young girl. She died tragically 
and very unexpectedly. And he had, I think, the same experience that you would find a lot of young men where he's like, oh, yeah, it happened and kind of didn't have a, well, as far as he's concerned at the time, not a big impact. But, and he started falling into the depression, right? He started to spend time in the Royal Melbourne Botanical Gardens because he worked like just across the road. And he noticed pretty quickly that he just felt good in the gardens and he's feeling better. And he's sort of, oh, well, this is nice. Obviously, spending time in nature is making me feel better and I'm not in this weird, yucky state. And then one day he broke down crying and there was a realisation that it took, I guess, you know, that healing to give him the vulnerability to process the emotions that he just never dealt with. You know, and that's that typical guy thing to not actually be able to deal with it. And, and that was the aha moment for me. It's like, this is how people should be doing it. We need to be in nature, shower nature, and that's going to help people deal with that process and be open hearted to be able to face that very, very difficult grief and to process it. So, it luckily, he'd spent so much time there that he got to know Tim Enterweiss that runs the Royal Melbourne Botanical Gardens. And he said, Hey, mate, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to find great bits of property, plant trees, and people can scatter their ashes. And he said, look, great idea, but it's not going to work. Everything's going to die because, of, you know, the problems with the ash profile. Here's a few labs you can go to that might be able to help you deal with the pathology and deal with the problems with the ash so it can become a neutral or positive impact on the trees rather than being a problem. Fast for 18 months and this lab had produced the results. So gone from killing all of the trees with ashes to actually having not just okay results, you know, but they were better than the test samples. So the treated ashes were now actually providing stronger growth in trees. And that was the time when I was looking and I said, hey, you know what, this seems like a real thing. I'm going to come and join you. So that was about seven years ago. Wow. And that must have been when Tim really first started at the gardens too. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but... Um, yeah, I was there for 13 years. Oh, yeah. So um, that would have been about the time where Tim was just appointed CEO then. Okay. Well, I mean, and you would have probably seen Warren a few times <laughs> walking around the gardens like a weirdo. He's like, I know. How bizarre. He and I are pretty similar. And like, we're very different in a lot of ways, but we both like to be barefoot. So I, I guarantee you he'd have been but walking around the gardens. Oh, that's amazing. So, yeah, I probably would have seen him. I used to work between Melbourne and Cranbourne. So, yeah, best of both worlds. And what did you do there? Producer of events, yeah. so major events that they did. Yeah, cool. Part of the programming team. Yeah. So tell me, you left or is this at the point where you were, you'd moved back to Australia and you were wondering what you were going to do? when Warren had this idea? Yeah, I'd been back in Australia for a bit and I'd been sort of working in the in-house legal role for a while and I was just looking for a change. And so it was just perfect timing and I thought, you know what, this seems like the right time in my life to take a real punt and do something that I think I can give everything to that's going to give me that, something I'm passionate about, right? Not just a job, something that I can really give everything to into and yeah it's been an adventure it has certainly not all been easy and a lot of learning and a lot of difficulties but you know and I find pride a difficult emotion to have but when I do look out here and I see you know family sitting on a picnic rug spending time together with the kids I just know that I've you know we've actually managed to do something really important and I do feel moments of pride with that it's fantastic, you know, and I know that when I started out, I wanted the environmental part of it was a major push. I was like, I want to have a positive impact on the environment. And that's still great. Obviously, what we do has a huge, huge positive impact on the environment. But being able to play this role in such a pivotal life experience and support for people in such a raw and vulnerable time of need, it's so beautiful. And it's such a gift to be able to be there. That's the real bit that drives me now. Obviously, I, I love seeing, you know, this little ecosystem that we have here thriving. And, you know, like the bird population's increasing. We see the little ducklings and the little chicks come through every spring. Got a little echidna that lives here under the place. We've got swans that call this place home, you know, not all the time, but they come here for probably a few months of the year. It's fantastic. I love it. And actually, we just got, we've had two beehives and we've just got another two beehives put in here as well so it's you know all a part of the story but it's great you know we extract honey every once 
I will just give it to the clients as a nice little thank you. It's fantastic. I love it. And tell me, Luke, for someone who's unfamiliar with what Mornington Green is and what your point of difference is, Perhaps you can explain what makes Mornington Green unique as a, is it a resting place? Yeah, it's a a final resting place. You know, I was thinking about it the other day. I was talking to somebody and look, I'm not religious, you know, not an atheist, but I'm not religious. I guess I'm agnostic. But, you know, I think Mornington Green is sort of like a divine natural chapel, right? It's a cathedral of nature. What it is, it's a final resting place that doesn't feel or look like a cemetery. It's growing, it's evolving, it's changing. And for families, it's not a full stop. You know, we've got a lot of really sad stories. And one of the things we've noticed is that planting a tree and having a tree for, a, you know, let's say you've lost a child, it's this moment of beautiful color that comes into a very dark and sad part of your life. And Unlike having the ashes in an urn or in a cemetery or in a you know burial plot, it's a full stop. That's just done and that's there. This is a growing tree, and you can come through the seasons. You see it grow, and you can see it have a difficult time. You can see it then flowering and becoming robust. It's a big difference, and it gives family a ongoing connection. You know, and for so many people, I think that's the biggest point of difference is. When you come in here, and I'm guessing you would have noticed, I'll just ask you, did it feel like a cemetery when you came through the gates? Did it feel like a cemetery when you came through the gates? No. Firstly, it reminded me very much of a golf course. There was no headstones. There was no plaques that I could actually see interrupting the view of the landscape. And I'm thinking, am I in the right place? And that's, look, I think that's the right thing. Yeah. You know, I probably haven't answered your question clearly enough. You know, on a very practical level, it is a final resting place. We take cremated ashes. We have an organic process that shifts the composition of the ash. So the, there is a quite a few harmful aspects to ash that would normally mean that a tree's roots would evade it and the trees would very likely die. We have a process that's very organic and it shifts the composition of the ash so that that harmful profile is mitigated. And all of the beautiful trace elements that are in the ash, you know, potassium, calcium, you know, phosphorus, they will all actually feed into the tree and become part of the tree. So that tree's leaves and flowers growing and from the energy of your loved ones, you know, from those remains, which I think not a full stop, it's a continuation of a cycle. So, you know, to give a comparison, you would say, look, this is a forest version of a cemetery where families don't go to a grave plot and a tombstone. They go to a tree, a family tree that can be shared amongst family for generations where they're all part of the same tree. And the feeling and experience is the differentiator. The feeling when you come in, you're not hit by morose and sadness and be quiet you're embraced by this beautiful feeling of forest and garden and nature and growth. And what we hear from clients is it doesn't remind them of the end. It reminds them of the life that they shared and they get to, you know, have that very significant difference, you know, and it's a place that people are happy to bring their kids to. You know, often people say, I don't bring my kids to Pop's grave grave sucks i don't want them to come they don't have a good time and it's sad and it's kind of scary this is a place where kids love to come to and we you know i'll tell you some stories but you know one of the saddest ones but also beautiful was a mom with her daughter she said well so mom am i still going to be able to hug you once you're gone and say yeah you can hug the tree you know and the picture of somebody hugging a tree that's living and growing versus the picture of a child hugging a tombstone they're very different And they're different because they have a different feeling, a different energy. So the fundamental difference is having a place where memories continue. I think often if you choose to be scattered or if your ashes are in an urn, and even if you're in a cemetery, if the family isn't likely to enjoy that experience, you're likely to be forgotten. And people don't want to be forgotten. And let's be honest, we don't want to forget. And so by creating a space that people actually love to visit, we ensure that memory continues, you know, that, that, that memory of life. And people sit there and laugh and tell jokes and enjoy each other's company on a nice sunny day. And it's, 
I think that's crucial. I think continuing the family story and having a place where we can embrace the richness of our family and the beautiful lives that we shared and the memories, I think it's really crucial. So that's the fundamental difference. It's a place that resonates with everybody. And, you know, nature is a grand unifying part of us. You know, we are all part of nature and everybody feels comfortable in nature. So, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. And tell me, Luke, what sort of numbers, you know, we know statistically that maybe only half the population have even written a will. It's actually a little bit less than half. So how many people are actually motivated by the choice of being able to choose a tree that they're coming to you to pre-plan? their funeral yeah so look one of our goals is to shift that right because we know as you said most people are not planning ahead right you know and and we sit into this and we go okay there's an aspect of that where people are just scared to talk about it or face their mortality but then there's also just a big factor i think the bigger factor is the options just don't sound attractive you know and i think when you go okay so what am i going to go do pick a casket pick the handles on a casket pick a nice urn somewhere, you know, they're just very unattractive options that don't seem like something you want to do. You go, whatever, I don't care. If that's the options, I don't care. Just leave it. You can decide. But if you've got an option, they go, oh, yeah, I love I love the idea. I grew up and we had a jacaranda in our house. Yes, I want to go find a tree. It's a nice experience and it's something that we know that we've got about 75 to 80% of our clients are pre-planning, the vast majority of them. And they know, and we see it all the time, they'll come out regularly. That's a huge figure. Yeah, it's huge. And it's unexpected. But for them, they know that they have a tree. They'll come out regularly and they'll bring their kids. And what it means is that they've got positive living memories in this space. So when the time does come, it's going to be one of the worst days of that kid's life, of your children's life when you do die. They're coming into a place that is warm, that they have nice positive memories. It's not this alien place that you only ever visit on a horrible day. It's a place that's really lovely and it's nurturing and it's comfortable. That is such a big gift to give to people. So for us, I think when people do hear about us and they start to understand this process of, oh, no, you're not picking a car, so you're going for a walk around these gardens, finding a trip that really speaks to you. It's quite a lovely experience. It's a nice way to spend your day. You know, even if you don't get a tree, it's a pretty nice way to spend your day walking around the gardens, having a coffee and enjoying you know watching flowering trees it's not the worst thing in the world so i think we are able to have an impact there which i think is really important so if we can try to shift that needle and get more people pre-planning and getting their ducks in a line i think that would be a fantastic result i think we're going to find that that will hold families together and bind them together at the most fundamental time of need you know i think in having the ability to just be with each other emotionally and hold that space is so important. We're trying to deal with contracts and what are the different options and, you know, and going to different providers and then trying to get auntie and uncle to agree, not conducive to that healing process and being together. So, yeah, we're doing something right. And I think the more that we can make this process attractive, the more we're going to find that people actually are bold enough to take those steps and that big act of love of planning ahead. I mean, you're doing a similar thing, right? With the 10, 15, right? The point is, is it you've got to make it something that people go, okay, I don't need to put it on a back burner anymore. It's easy enough, right? And so for you, it's more of a, hey, Stop ignoring us. It's 15 minutes. You can do it. I promise you 15 minutes is doable. It's not a five-hour session with your lawyer. You can just knock this out really quickly and bit by bit we'll get through it. For us, it's like, hey, this doesn't have to be a horrible, morose, sad thing. You can be actually have a really lovely day and find a tree. And it's actually, in the end, way cheaper than the old process. And I think we're finding in this industry people have really moved away from full services and one, it's partially because of religious reasons. You know, pe- there's far less, you know, religious people out there. But then the other thing is, I don't think it's the money problem. People don't mind spending money on something so important, but that needs to resonate. You don't want to spend $10,000, $15,000, which is the, you know, it's typically about $5,000 excluding a final resting place. And then you add that on, it's another six to 12 grand for, you know, pretty standard options. 
people don't want to spend that for an experience that doesn't resonate, that doesn't make them feel connected, that the family doesn't hold on to, doesn't help them with the grief. We're getting there bit by bit and we just need more people to know about us, you know. Whether it's right for them or not, that's up to them, but just to know. And tell me, Luke, um, this is where I find it quite different is the fact that you're not having people plant a tree in memoriam. You're actually already have the trees planted. It's a horticulturally sound landscape that has been designed by a landscape architect and I believe was Andrea Proctor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, another connection from the garden. Yeah, yeah. And so to actually walk into the landscape, it feels like it's been planted with purpose Mm. and you're walking in amongst something I found anyway that was already growing and starting to show signs of, you know, changes of the seasons and flowerings. And that's what I find really interesting is that you can choose something that is living, I suppose. I, I can see why people want to connect to that. Yeah. And it's, and I mean, look, I, I think you've hit the nail on that. You haven't skimped on any point of the process. You know, as you said, the trees are all planted in groves. Adria's, you know, follow the best practice standards for forest type planting. The aim is so, you know, instead of going out to visit, let's say mum's birthday was in summer, so you got a jacaranda tree for it because it's beautiful purple flowers. It's a beautiful experience to go see her tree as all these purple flowers are. But the way they're planted in groves, we've got like 56 or something like that jacarandas all together so you're not just visiting mum's tree in full flower you're visiting the tree amongst a full forest of them all in flower and they're planted when i say they're planted that forest so that when they're mature the canopies will touch and so you're going to have this massive canopy yeah, beautiful. purple flowers and like i genuinely think the impact of that to open up your heart like we were talking about before what a beautiful experience right to come on a sad day to go visit mum's tree and then just be overwhelmed with this opulent beauty what a reminder of the gift it is to be alive so you know and everything has been placed and designed with a lot of purpose you know we've done obviously soil testing samples to make sure she knows exactly the drainage types of different parts of the land sun exposure wind exposure She's been, you know, Andrew's fantastic, you know, she knows what she's doing. So, yeah, and I think it is helpful for people to come out and know that the tree they're picking is something that is already doing well. You know, the first three years of trees are tough and generally it's a sliding scale, as you would know, right? Highest risk is here and then it drops down like this and then plateaus. So, you know, most of the trees that people are choosing now have been in the ground for three years now. So they're kind of past that point of, great concern and people can rest assured that the trees are going to be pretty likely to be there in the next 40, 100 years. I mean, some of the trees we have here, those Queensland cowries can live for a thousand years, which is pretty cool. And I'm going to come back and ask you about the different types of trees people can choose from. But just bearing in mind that Melbourne weather, lots of trees fall, what happens when there is that situation where either a a tree falls or I'm assuming there's a process that you have in place about that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look it's a it's it's like a it's a very, very clear question. And we've just had that, right? We've just had a week of ridiculous i mean they must have been wins i i can't remember ever having so many like that and we did lose two trees in it when i say lose damage enough that listen i think we're better off to replace now there's um one of the trees which is memorialized in it and the other one did not so the one without the ashes is um we ripped the tree and we just informed the client we say look here's the photos of the damage We've replaced the tree. We have a tree that's, and it's for free. We replace them for free. We charge for the replacement of trees. Um, And it's got ashes. We will always inform the client before we do anything. So we let them know of the damage. Um, Why? Um, If there's options, we will give options to the client and say, look, you know, sometimes you'll have a damage that we think the tree can get over. Cut back and say, listen, 
um, I think there's going to get a, you know, you might, for example, but there's a strong chance that you're going to get a new leader and we'll say, look, if you want to, we can come with this tree or we will remove the tree. And if we do remove the tree, as long as the tree hasn't died from um, if it's disease, we have to remove it. But as long as it hasn't died from disease, we'll mulch that tree and use the mulch tree that goes in. So we still have that energy stay in the area. Um, and I mean, on that point, but it still seems to be so in the there zone where, because where we know well, when, if you put in a new tree, they're still going to be absorbing the know, roots. Are the coral um, issues with trees as they age, etc. But it sounds like the process that you have in place is that it's still part of that system of returning back to nature and providing new life for new trees, new plants, even as mulch to actually enter that whole circular ecosystem. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, that's always, you know, we've got some, we're pretty fixated, you know, one of that cycle of life and ensuring that that memory is on its space. And ensuring that, you know, what are the varieties or the species uh, that people can choose? We're pretty paranoid about a few things, but that's, uh, that's one of them. It's okay. I don't know them, so I can't test you. <laughs> well, you've got a lot. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, we've got, you know, golden wattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if I, I might miss some. So see, I'd, I'll start off in a what I think wattle. Um, we've got red buds. You know, uh, I don't ask me the botanical names. I'll mess it up. Um, they're quite cool. The red bud, pink crepe myr myrtles, um, cherry blossoms, flowering ano pears. Ginkgos, um, then we've got uh, Carimbia fissifolias, red, red flowering gum, but, um, pink flowering yellow gums, you know, the sort of classic, but then we've also got the tulip magnolias with the purple. Um, we've got jacarandas, tree. Such a variety. And when I'm Any, I maples, you reel it off, I'm thinking you have a lot of trees. I think we've run happen. the gambit now and Queensland carries. It's a lot of trees. Well, look, we have about 34 acres. So we got plenty of space. We got probably another 20 years of here. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful property. I mean, being in the next golf game in, it felt like a golf course. It did used to be a nine-hole golf course, um, which was a, just a great platform to work with, um, because it had good drainage, um, had irrigation throughout, obviously. Um, one of the negatives was all the NPK fertilizer and herbicides and pesticides. It was generally used. As a failing golf course, they weren't spending that much money on, on those products. So luckily, we didn't have that much rehab to do, but we, you know, we use all organic fertilizers, so it's all um, biological. And um, we've dumped tons and tons and tons of this property. It's really cool thing, actually, when we first got here, you dig up the grass, it and now you dig up the grass, and the roots are like it four or five times as big. It's fantastic. It's really good. When you give it the opportunity to. There's worms to, and so fungus everywhere. You, it's really, really positive around. to see the impact and on the soil me, conditions. I had a look when I was out there and saw your secret blue liquid that Warren worked on. Tell me a little bit about the process of how you place the ashes in beside the trees. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good one to talk about because I, you know, we've, we've been doing so much and so that we've we've just never shifted. And I, I'll be frank, the news is actually just into a tree. It sounds like we have some scientific process where we inject it into the edge of the tree or something, and it's not like that at all. Um, you know, all the science has been done with that painted to formula um on the day it's actually very it is quite a beautiful ritual it's nice to be able to invite families to take part i think often in a uh, traditional 
your spectators watching great opportunity to get people in, literally get their hands dirty. So chamber, so they find a dead ball and they dig a chamber that's on an ankle. Um, it goes pretty deep, about one and a half metres deep underneath the root ball of the tree. Yeah, really beautiful. And the, the setup, so we'll have the white chairs at the table at the setup and there's flowers. It's quite lovely. It looks almost like a little wedding, to be honest, for the ceremony. But we'll have, it's quite pretty. It's nice. Um, and so we have paramic soil, which is a mineral compound that buffers the alkalinity of the ash. And then we have the blue liquid and some watering can. And this soil that's I mean, you've been taken from the hole in in a tub next next, and essentially the family is in pouring the ash and the paramagnet oil into that. So they pour that in together and it mixes together while they pour, and then the soil is put back into the hole. It is also then poured to the hole as well. And during this process, one of the beautiful things that um, she's so thoughtful and she puts so much care into every family. She's going to invite me to on, we've got a uh, very uh, thin biodegradable paper so they can write a note to that loved one. It's a final opportunity to say something. So whether it's, oh, sorry, I missed saying this to you and it's a final, final opportunity to say that and, and then the soil goes back in and then so actually the dust has been cut out in a little circle. You can't tell that anybody's been there. Um, and that's it. It's super organic. So, and and the kids, we often have the kids. They're doing that, you know, and they're pouring the put, you know, in their hands dirty, and it, it's really a beautiful thing to see. And I think having to hands on offer something love so much. I think it's a really um, it's a really loved opportunity from family. I just rely. And I love that note. Wrong. That they, the they do do a fantastic job. Putting it in really the important hole. for people and for the, I think for the that's family really to do something who, who themselves did you say as well. You know? Was the person responsible um, for that idea? Yeah. Um, Louis in house plays. Um, you know, so she'll run the ceremonies. Um, she just did the. I think I was mentioning to you today. We had the ceremony for um, a pet dog that was that passed away. So um, she ran that. So she's extremely thoughtful. She's you know. So that means you also have places for does. pets. Uh, you got this. Um, I was. About the pets, yeah. The works that we do have, we have a dedicated pet garden, so pet ashes can go through the same treatment process, and then they're placed underneath a shared garden. Flowers and trees, all in this beautiful garden, pet Eden. Um, also, the opportunity for pets to be joined with their families within a tree, a legacy, and that's what we had today. So, um, Suki was the dog's name. Um, I feel like I'm getting that wrong, but I'm sure Zuki and she go into their oak tree. But um, for Hazel, uh, Glenn, they both know that they're going to be joining Zuki one day. And I mean, we're, we're, it's such a beautiful story. They said, um, so Zuki actually was the one that brought them together. So um, Hazel had lost her husband, her, her first husband, and she was going through you know, the, the difficult grief. And her friend said, you've got to get a dog, you've got to get a dog. And she said, I'm not getting a dog. And then before she knew it, she had a dog. If I had dogs before, I didn't know how to take care of her. And she still wanted to travel, which is why she was sort of pushing back. But these, she then started to find um, places that were dog friendly and she started to places and it became a thing. So she would travel around the UK and places that were dog friendly and that became quite a thing that she did. And then one day she was going to um, London for her granddaughter's third birthday and the hotel pool suddenly happened last. And so her daughter said, oh, look, I've got a guy at work who'll take care of the dog. As her Claire, now husband. Uh, and so she, he'd taken care of the dog and the dog loved him but never liked any others. And that was the start of the relationship. And they said when they got married, 
Yes, and that's amazing. You know, this beautiful and part of their so family. Does that mean- and now uh, she's died before I can actually, or even but generations, she's, uh, at home in the and tree pets, by the sound of it, can actually go around the one legacy tree. Uh, it's lovely. So the largest tree can take eight people can share it, which is plenty for several generations. And in reality, more than eight people can go in the tree as long as it's more than seven years apart. We just would rather under promise and over deliver because we wouldn't want to have an incident where, you know, God forbid, you know, let's say it was a medium tree for two people and they wanted four for the kids, but they all died in a car accident. And I said, well, we have to wait seven years for the next two. So, but the reality is, is yes, it's really cool in that way. So, you know, our most popular trees are actually a medium and a large. So that's two and five, which means it's, you know, either a couple that want to share it or a couple that want to plan for their kids to, you know, come and join them at some point in the future. I mean, obviously, we do have the extra large ones, and they, and they are popular as well, but not as popular. They're often used, you know, you might have a couple who've got mum and dad's ashes, and then they know they've got them, and then they've got kids as well. So they're thinking, just like you said, multi-generational, which I think is really great. You know, the, often people like really desperate to try to get into so-and-so cemetery because mum and dad are there, but there's no plots left and they might end up paying twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for a great plot. It's nice to know that you can all actually not just be close, but literally all creating these seats and these flowers and the leaves on the tree. Like, what a beautiful thing. Lovely. Yeah. It's a, it's a really lovely, you know, story and, and such a legacy to, to leave. So tell me, have you you know, picked your own tree, Luke? I have. I got my tree is up there already. I've been a little bit ostentatious. I've got a, a modern day ficus up on the hill. Yeah, nice. With all the aerial roots that'll come down. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of my favourite trees. So, I mean, I've got a lot of favourite trees now. <laughs> like I used to have a few trees that I liked and now every, you know, like you get so enamoured with all these different trees that we see. But yeah, that's the tree I've got. And, you know, so my, my dad's got his tree here and obviously Warren has his tree here. You know, it's a central part of the family. And tell me, what's the future for Mornington Green? Look, we are growing pretty rapidly. One of the things we do here is it's not an accident that when you walked in, it didn't feel like a cemetery. It's not just because of the, the energy that we hold here. And one of the ways that we keep this from being like a memorial garden, which often people expect a memorial garden when they hear of us, and it isn't the same at all, as you would have noticed, is we have a lot of living events, you know. So we have planting days, we have, you know, Christmas in July, we have all kinds of events throughout the year, you know, Daffodil Day. And this summer we're going to be doing again the world's largest sunflower. So Last summer, we planted this flower bed. You would have seen that flower bed. It's like 50 metre yeah, long it flower was amazing. bed. In the shape. And we had 3,000 giant Russian sunflowers. This year, we're going to widen the sunflower and have a full variety of sunflowers, all those cool, you know, those orange and black ones and fluffy ones. And it's just, you know, all of these different events bring people in to enjoy the beauty of life and to just embrace that lovely feeling nature just being in glory you know and so it shifts it does shift the experience and we had one of the clients that came to christmas in july he lost a husband and even though having a tree is beautiful it's still a very sad time in life when you've just lost your life partner and she said she came specifically to christmas in july because she, she was like it's time it's been a few weeks i want to shift this experience now and she had a really lovely time there she met some other great families that have trees here and she said, that was everything I needed. And now, you know, when I come here, I've now got this shift of experience, you know. And that's what it's all about, embracing being alive and those living memories, not just, the, you know, being sad about the end. So that's part of it, more and more of that, you know, creating more and more events. We want to have art in here. Aside from that, the future of us, we are looking to expand. So we are looking for places interstate, part of this living legacy group, and, and so we're looking for players interstate. We get emails every day. You know, when are you coming to Queensland? When are you going to be in South Australia? So we want to find another place so we can service more Australians and give them a 
you know, better experience. We've started the next garden, which I think is going to be called Lumia Garden from the Indigenous word from the local mob. And I think it means to rest, rest in place. Yeah, it's nice. I think it's important to pay homage to the traditional custodians of the land. And it's nice that it sort of works in with what we do. And 60% of that garden now, so that'll be released once this garden's full or at least close to being full. I got the community plan to go days, but we are establishing now a volunteer gardening group. One of the things we realized, it is like we've noticed just how lonely some of the more elderly clients are and they're really often quite desperate to have purpose and to be a part of something. And so by creating this volunteer group that can regularly come out, we put on, you know, tea and biscuits and obviously we have all the tools. We purchase the tools and the plants and the bulbs and whatnot. But what a, a nice thing for them to be, come in, be a part of a group and have friends and have a purpose, but they're also helping out. You know, they know at the back of their minds the flowers they plant are going to potentially greet somebody on a really crappy day and give them a smile, right? And just see, like right now we've got tulips popping up from one of our previous planting days that the community helped plant. And it's so beautiful. You can't help but get a little bit of a grin when you see them pop up. So more of that, more more community engagement, more events, you know, obviously expanding the stages as each garden grows through. And obviously, as I said, like just trying to find other little ways to create magic in the ceremony, hold the space better and allow people to connect in a more meaningful way. Yeah, that's really beautiful, Luke. And yeah, I really commend you on what you and Warren and your team have done because it's a, a very beautiful space to be around in. And yeah, you have you don't even really notice that it's part of a, a legacy garden and yeah it's it's just a really beautiful space with beautiful growing trees thank you Catherine. well thank you so much for your time today luke i really appreciate it thank you so much don't be caught dead forgetting to subscribe and here are some more videos we know you'll love